After Reading took a point home from Norwich to see off 2022, they opened the new year with a narrow defeat at in form at West Brom. Was it a worrying week for the Royals or just one of those days with brighter times ahead? Welcome to the Tyler Sen Podcast, episode 321. Welcome to 2023 as well for Reading FC. We're back underway for the calendar year. And uh, Happy New Year, of course, to Ross Weber, who joins me to uh, go through this game. It's a post-game show, Ross, so we're absolutely fresh and uh, ready to go. Yeah, these opinions could not be more half baked if I tried. So uh, I've uh, <laughs> I've been, I've got all the notes from the game that we've just been watching, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see what comes out in the next little while. But Happy New Year, everyone! Absolutely, Happy New Year. Hopefully, everyone had a Merry Christmas. Although we have done a show since Christmas, it feels a bit weird actually that this yeah. this post game show is not usually what we do for the Tyler's end, and because as we like to bake our half baked opinions into at least two thirds <laughs> baked opinions is what we right, kind of strive right. for. And also, yeah, we were we we don't usually have uh, so many shows over the Christmas period, but as I said last week, with the uh, World Cup break, I felt a little bit lazy turning around and telling everyone that I wasn't going to bother for this uh, <laughs> this week. So uh, I'm Mark Mayer, I haven't already in- introduced myself, the host of the Tyler Sim podcast by Reading fans. For Reading fans, we'll get into the recap of those two games in just a second, have some mailbag and FA Cup previewing coming up later on. Um, before we do that, a uh, big thank you to our sponsors, ZCZ Films and our Patreon subscribers. Right then, let's get into West Brom 1, Reading 0. Come rain or shine, it's time to relive the latest match action with the recap. This podcast is sponsored by ZCZ Films, Reading's oldest ultras. So where do we start with this one then, Ross? We had Scott Dan back in the 11 for the first time. Well, I was going to say the first time this year, but that kind of is a bit meaningless on the 2nd of January. The first time the first time he's played since early April, however, he only had two starts in 2022. Um, both of those, as you can tell, were early 22 as well. So a bit of a surprise to see him back in, but you know, still no Sam Hutchinson at the moment, I guess. Yeah. We kind of needed ways to to keep it fresh, and Bengo was on the bench and came on after a little bit. There was, um, of course, no Tom Holmes for this game after he picked up the knock in the in the um, the Norwich game. So, really, just a bit of a a bit of an interesting one that Dan came in. Ultimately, it I don't know how much it contributed to the fact that West Brom absolutely flew out the blocks, seven shots right. in their first 10 minutes, a really nice Joe Lumley kind of one-handed reaction save, um, the pick of the chances. But Reading didn't start particularly well in this game and Scott Dan being back meant that, was I don't know, for you, was there a bit more nerviness in the back line? It was certainly a little unfamiliar. Uh, my, and Dan was the surprise for me. I mean, I, I suppose he needs the, uh, the minutes as soon as possible, but I thought that, uh, the FA Cup game against Watford next week might have been the, uh, might have been the one that they went for. But, and he did have a slip in the, in the first five minutes of the game, Dan, that actually led to that Lumley, uh, great one handed save, I think. So yeah, five, five to 10 minutes in, <laughs> I was a little bit concerned about Scott Dan. Um, and, and his return to the team for in a game that was always going to be quite difficult. Um, you know, West Brom playing well right now, attacking well. They've only conceded two goals in their five games since the World Cup. So, yeah, really tricky game to bring Dan back in for. And the first 10 minutes was a little dodgy, but I thought that he got uh, I thought that he got better as the game went on. Yeah, I think uh, Reading definitely did grow into this game as a whole. In the first half, Junior Hoylet having a shot uh, quite well saved on the line after a bit mm. of play from Yaku Meite. And I suppose the the start of the second half, I wasn't feeling too pessimistic because, yeah, there was the dodgy start, but West Brom on really good form. They've not conceded at home in about four games now, I think, is with this result as well. And they've won all those, so... Reading can't just, you know, expect to to roll up and, and have long periods of possession and, and long spells of pressure in these sorts of games. So the problem for me, I guess, was that the second half, Reading did decline a little bit. Whether West Brom improved, I mean, that's up for debate, but it felt like not, we didn't really kind of grow further from uh, from the second half starting. And that meant that Dow DK got the goal on the hour mark. A good ball in, I would say. I have no real issue with the uh, with Guinness Walker in this, kind of stopping the cross. He got close to him, but it's still a good ball in. Scott Dan does lose his man, I think, if we're picking out somebody. But um, it's it's... 
it's probably not the worst goal in the world world to concede. It's not the greatest. And I suppose Reading after first the time. first hour probably couldn't really argue with being a goal down. No, I don't think so. And it's first time, uh, it's a first time cross. It's a first time header and it's a good, you know, glancing header across the front. Daryl DK is a, a good player. He played over here, um, in the MLS for a long time, had a, uh, like a almost, uh, one in two record for Orlando City and then, uh, for Barnsley as well. I mean, he's, he's a quality striker. Um, if you get the ball near him, you can see how big he is. I am Scott Dan. I'm sure that was a fun assignment for him first week back to be faced with a gigantic American coming at you. So, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, not too many complaints about the goal. And I, and I think that Reading did well to keep West Brom to the wings after the first 10 minutes or so. But something they were doing against Swansea, which I didn't see much of today, was really taking the pressing triggers and trying to actually uh, disrupt West Brom um, when they were building from the back. Um, they did it well against Swansea in, in a way that led to a goal. Um, so it would have been nice to see a little bit more of that today. I think West Brom brought the ball a little bit higher up the pitch, um, and that made it tough for Reading to pick on those triggers. But yeah, just a little bit weaker on the pressing side today, which I think sometimes for Reading just really makes it get a little bit turgid. Because when we sit in that low block, we try and attack quickly when we do get the ball. Um, you know, when we come up against a good team like West Brom, it's not always going to work. So, yeah, I think about after an hour, it was uh, probably the right. It, it was probably about accurate for how the game was going. Yeah, you say about that low block. I found it. It it didn't work on the counter attack for Reading today, did it? The the passes out of midfield weren't really there. Um, the game did change a little bit as it went on. Long and Zhao came on for the final twenty. Um, there, there were still chances um, for West Brom. There's one where Joe Lumley flew off his line, and then the ball in. I think it's Diangana flashed a. I mean, obviously, a pretty much an open goal head. Although there were a lot of defenders around him, that flashed wide, but. As that, you know, as as Long and Zhao came on, both the wing backs were changed as well. Was did, were you confident of a smash and grab equaliser? Did you feel like it was any point coming? I think because of West Brom's defensive record since Corbyn came in, and since, um, like I said, two in two goal, two goals conceded in in the five games since the World Cup, I was a little bit concerned because Reading on a team that are creating lots and lots of chances um one after the other at the moment they're more a team that tends to take their opportunities or at least gets a few opportunities a game and whether they play you know whether they get a result might be down to whether they take those opportunities maintain carol looked a little bit off it today so i think that bringing Zhao uh and long on was the right call um Jao looked a little bit better today. He, he was a little bit closer to the, you know, the tricky uh, dribbler that we that we know and love. So I thought that, you know, there were times when he um, could have wriggled through the back line by himself. And and overall, I thought the Reading actually did push and sustain pressure better than I might have expected. Um, but yeah, just a just a a few inches off. Maybe if that ramen header is just like a couple, like an inch lower on his forehead you know, right in the 86th minute from that corner, then we then we get a smash and grab point here. But yeah, perfectly fine performance. But I think that um, I wasn't super confident we were going to come back in this one. Yeah, that header was the best chance, wasn't it, from the uh, the corner that came back in. And and before that, Jao, I, I agree. I think Jao looked a little bit sharper today. I mean, that's compared to a player that's not really looked sharp for much of the season. But it's the question, I mean, the question for me with Zhao is to how Ince is going to get the best out of him is basically Long is the only player I think you can play him up front with. I don't think you can play yeah. him up front with Carroll or Mate. And we've seen that now that Carroll and Mate have got a bit of a thing going on. I think you can play Long with Carroll or Zhao. I don't think you can play Mate and Long together or... I mean, yeah, Long and Carroll, I think, would be a good would be a good matchup. So there's there's things there that maybe aren't maybe Paul Ince is working out haven't worked and he's not going back to, which is why he's stuck with Carroll and Mate for both yeah. of the games this week. Um the only other thing I'd add is that it it perhaps is more West Brom changing than us changing into why Reading as to why Reading had the last kind of 15 minutes looking a bit more sharp. There was no reason for West Brom to drop so deep because when they had the ball, when they're moving it round in our, you know, the middle third or in our final third, 
we didn't look a threat like we we're going to catch them and also they they were good at it so Reading generally speaking weren't nicking the ball off them and and creating opportunities that way either so West Brom yeah. dropping deep definitely suited Reading in my opinion and and really I mean if we had played 45 minutes like that it probably would have scored but just generally for the last 15 20 minutes wasn't really going to happen and and ultimately it didn't and it's a defeat and I suppose in in conclusion for this game we'll have a quick chat on Norwich in a second but for this game I guess is it it's not really one that's passed Reading by as such it's not one where I feel there's a massive regret about in terms of how we played it or anything certainly you can make the case that potentially with the way we started and everything it could have been one of those 4-0 defeats that we've had right. at Sheffield United and and such and Birmingham when we went 3-0 down really early on so in that sense there's a bit of improvement but generally speaking I think it's a game that that just kind of suits the narrative, doesn't it? It doesn't shift the pendulum one way or the other or the needle, does it? It's just one that we probably accepted was going to be this way and gave it a go at times, but that's just ultimately how it fell. Yeah, there was no collapse, and that's good because I, I think that after the first ten minutes, you know, we've like you were saying with Sheffield United, we've seen it before uh, when Reading are a good um, team on the road, um, and they and they go down early on. Sometimes it really snowballs very quickly, and that didn't happen. They got you know they got control. I wouldn't say they got control of the game actually right away, but they at least. Um, managed to pin you know t- managed to push West Brom back enough that they weren't constantly defending their own box after the first 15 minutes so um I think that the fact that they managed to impact the game um you know even though West Brom um had control of possession for most of the time that was encouraging good to see Femi Aziz back too uh hopefully he sticks around for a little bit longer this time but uh his uh his uh, crosses from the wing looked pretty good so i think that um getting aziz back into the team could give us another um angle from which to use long jao mate these players um aziz is something somebody who can give them a little bit give them something a little bit different so yeah i thought it was good to see him back yeah, certainly. I mean, if we didn't have so many strikers, certainly Zhao or potentially Carroll, I'd definitely play him up front with, you know, Ince and, uh, and Aziz either side of him. I think that'd be a definitely a good, probably be a plan B in reality for what we're talking about now for Reading. But yeah, good to see him back from injury for the final five minutes. Um, let's do some Norwich then. One all draw yep. at Carrow Road to uh, round off the calendar year for Reading. And it's actually got a pretty similar ish pattern to this uh, West Brom game West Norwich scoring early in the second half with a goal that I mean you can pick apart a couple of things but actually I thought it was a better goal Adam Eda scoring for Norwich than it was that DK scored for West Brom against Reading but Reading did come back and get the uh, the penalty late on Andy Carroll stepping up and scoring the stats make this out to be very similar 11 shots apiece Norwich having one more on target with possession not a million miles apart um I guess the the question with this one was was this game a smash and grab or was it a deserved point? Because I'm probably saying, but well, I, I definitely think actually that Reading did deserve a point and were just as good as a, what yeah. is a, obviously not a great Norwich team, but certainly a, a more powerful Norwich team. I think Reading um, definitely deserved a point in this game, and um, I think the I think that the best players on the pitch on. Um, on Tuesday night, were playing for Reading. I thought Andy Carroll was great. Um, obviously, we can get a little bit one dimensional um, when we're when we're playing with just him up top because the the tendency is to just chuck it up to him as soon as possible. But it gives Lumley something different to do at the back. Um, you know, he's pretty adept at spotting when Carroll's got himself into some space. Um, so yeah, with the knockdowns and things like that, you know, Carroll was being used as the first point of attack, which was nice rather than the end point and i think that that's kind of the way to use him a few reading managers now have liked that um with the set plays to or with crosses to put the ball to the back post and then have it go back across the net and cow is perfect at that um so we had a few chances um from those knockdowns that that could have gone better in the first half and hey then we might have been talking about if it was a victory i might have called it a smashing grab but i think with the point that's that's more than fair and hey if if uh if nabi sar had been able to out jump uh josh Sargent a couple times then we might be looking at a victory not a not a draw yeah, for sure. I think that's a, oh, as I say, Norwich are really in a bit of a struggling period. In the last podcast, we were kind of pondering whether their 
they were going to have their massive rally having sacked their manager or whether they're maybe a bit of a team and club in decline at the moment. Um, with hindsight of the fact they've lost again today does point towards the latter, which um, which is kind of what I thought was going to happen, to be honest. But I'm certainly happy for Reading to pick up a point um, at Carrow Road. That isn't a bad point whatsoever. So what it leaves us then is Reading 11th in the table. I think actually the Preston have scored while we started recording this. So it's 12th in the table. Um, okay. Still still three points off the playoffs and uh, 10 points off relegation. So certainly a good position to start 2023 and even with the defeat today, although the goal difference is bad. So in reality, we're kind of four points off the playoffs because what would we need? A 13 goal swing on Millwall to jump them if we were level with them in sixth position. So 12th in the table, I think, with a draw, defeat and a win in the last three games is perfectly acceptable for where Reading are at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. Let's get into some mailbag. We usually have Paul Ince now, but he's not actually spoken to the media yet. So we'll go into the mailbag and hear what you're thinking after the West Brom game. For all the latest Reading news, analysis and opinion, visit the website at thetilehurstend.com. Okay, then we've uh, we sent the tweet out about half an hour before now, so we've had a few questions, which is good. Thanks to everyone for getting in touch. We have the uh, the Twitter, the Facebook, and the Gmail, the Tireless End at gmail.com for your thoughts and opinions any questions you have and just general thoughts on the show if something's really bugging you then we we'll always encourage you to get in touch and we'll hopefully fix it up um let's start off then with tom saturday royal saying best middle of the park partnership we have discuss and surely uh we have to be more positive in the way we approach away from home um rather than preparing for a draw hoping for a smash and a grab i think just quickly on the the latter point there i do think the we we could have penned in West Brom a little bit more. But as I said earlier, I don't think it was really on us to pen these teams in. I think West Brom just had more quality on the ball than us today. And when we did try and play passes, we weren't good enough for it. So for me, it's not necessarily an approach problem, more kind of a personnel problem. And actually, that links in with the other half of Tom's question, is saying the middle of the park partnership, is that mm-hmm. when we play Loom and Hendrick together, yes, Ince is in there and he, he's... He does what he can, but he's not a brilliant passer of the ball, is he? He's a great worker and has a good end product and stuff. But I feel like with those three guys, the actual ability to control the game at a place like West Brom is already kind of diminished. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. Um, I do think that Loom was better today. I actually think he had a pretty good game. It always looks a little bit chaotic with him, um, but it was uh, chaos that was kind of working today. Um, But I really do worry about Hendrick. I know that that Tyler Hurst then said this a few times now, um, but I'm just not really sure what he's offering. Um, The stats the other night against Norwich um, suggested that Loom, uh, who is, I would normally think of him as the defensive midfielder in in that group i think loom had more than double uh the passes into the final third that hendrick had against norwich so i'm just not really sure what hendrick does um I wrote a piece a few weeks ago saying that reading if they can get anyone in uh in in january um, which i think will involve somebody going in the other direction um potentially a, a jaria um i i you know i don't know we, we, whatever happens there but i if reading need anything they need to actually replace uh swift's creativity now um he really showed us what we were missing in the first 15 minutes of that game today swift and then uh and then did something that he could do from time to time which was go missing completely after that but um we're missing that yeah that that ability to just bring the ball from tom holmes at, at the back and get it to andy carroll along the ground rather than having to just chuck it over the top and you know hope that one of them can get on there so i think the answer to what's our best uh midfield partnership right now is uh, there isn't really a great answer to that and uh yeah hopefully loom can continue to have good games coming up yeah it's a bit of a hypothetical isn't it because i mean we've got peter Marta asking as well got to ask why we set up in the usual way to sit off when it's extremely clear they have the quality to hurt from anywhere on the pitch the first 20 minutes we were giving them freedom in the first in the final two thirds of the pitch seems mad to me and this is this is the point that is it uh, Loom, yeah, I think he had a better game and yes, it does seem like he uses every second available to him and often the few ones that he doesn't have to make a pass and they don't always go where their men go either. But you look at the bench, um, Long Zhao, Rahman, Aziz, Buzanis, Saar, none of those are playing centre mid, obviously. And Benge's the interesting one, I think, in this because 
with Fauna out, and I mean, we're not playing Hutchinson or McIntyre high up the pitch at the moment. Um, I think that Fauna would be in there for me, probably with Loom and Ince, although that feels to me I a agree. little bit lightweight, maybe as a three. Hen- but I mean, yeah. not that I'm saying Hendrick is the is the 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 better option. The question for me is Mbenge, does he fit in that centre midfield three? Would you put him Loom and Ince together, maybe? Or or is that That'd be again interesting? Because we don't know how great Mbenge plays at centre mid, do we? No, that's a really good question. Yeah, I'd I'd like to see it. Um, I wouldn't mind also seeing Tom McIntyre take a couple of, uh, maybe not starts, but take a couple of second halves, a couple of last half hours uh, in that sort of position, because I think that he might get squeezed out once we're fitter um at center back so it might be interesting to see what McIntyre can do in there you know he's not a huge body but I wouldn't call him lightweight necessarily he does um you know he he does defend properly he gets physical with his opponents so yeah I think Mbenge could be good um and McIntyre is another one that I wouldn't mind seeing there but really for me the solution is um you know a replacement in that in that position yeah, well, I was considering doing a news bites on the transfer window. Now it is open, but I just genuinely don't think we can do anything no. um, with the uh, EFL transfer embargo is continuing. This is the final transfer window, I think. I mean, touch wood that we're under this kind of EFL embargo nonsense. So hopefully that's going to end soon. And hopefully also we're going to have a situation where, um, you know, when we're, we're avoiding the suspended sentences which obviously are still in kind of in action at the moment so um transfer wise there's really not much to report um and obviously the potential goings in terms of Carolyn and Benge um we've not heard anything at, at this moment um with their new contract so keep an eye on the Tyler Send social media and the website for updates on that um we're turning our attention to Watford in the FA Cup now with the final couple of questions um, we'll do Watford specifically in a little bit, but generally speaking, Ben Thomas saying, do we want a cup run? Do we need a cup run? Um, El Ginge actually responding to this saying he wasn't too bothered at the start, but now he's confident we're safe saying, why not? Um, injuries is yeah. the only kind of worry that he has with this and he wants to see Femi Aziz start. I mean, I think I'd probably agree with all of that. I think that typically you only ever say we're not bothered for a cup run when you are really competing or, you know, really struggling, but actually, I mean, we have got numbers in the squad. Any of those players on the bench, probably all of them would be starting against Watford. So that's seven changes before you've done anything. And yeah, why not? I think we've got yeah. we've got a midweek after the Watford game as well. So I think generally speaking, a cup run is absolutely something that this season could do with. Yeah, I think so. I think that um, it could actually be a really nice summary of the progress that has been made in the last year and um, where we're at now versus January 2022. Um, I, I think that it would be nice to get past Watford in, in the third round. Uh, obviously, that's not the most exciting. It's not the magic of the cup, Watford. Um, but uh, if we can get through, maybe get ourselves a, a game against, um, you know, a, a Premier League side or something like that, could just be really good for the atmosphere around the club again. And I also think that January is going to be a pretty tough month from a league perspective. We're playing a lot of good teams this month. Um, so having victories in the FA Cup or at least having, you know, positive performances in the FA Cup. Um, that could help us to maintain the sort of positive attitude in the group as we as we go through this tricky period uh, in the championship. So yeah, I mean, there's never anything wrong with a cut run, is there? It, you 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 care about it once it starts going well. It's uh it's something that it, it sort of takes you away with it if it happens. I always feel. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's uh let's get into that now. There's one final um tweet that we've had and that's kind of leads on leads us on to the uh the big match preview discussion. Uh, Nathan Cole tweeting us saying, "Go strong for the cup game as Watford will have their reserve team out when we face them," which is a good point. Let's get into big match preview now and talk about Watford at home in the FA Cup. Be loud and be proud and back the boys and make some noise. Come on you Oz. Shout out to this week's podcast sponsor, ZCZ Films, showing that age is no barrier to being a hooli hoop. 
So we have the first thing I'm going to say about the Watford game is that it's a 12:30 p.m. kickoff. So uh, oh. if you're turning up at 3 p.m. in Select Car Leasing Stadium, you're probably going to find that it's very empty, <laughs> bar a couple of people waiting for a taxi um, or maybe a straggling bus. Unfortunately, Ross, as someone who's out in the states watching games, yeah. um, that's an early start, I believe, isn't it? That is, yeah, that's a 7:30 uh, a.m. start for me, which that's uh, not too bad. We've had a few seven o'clocks which i haven't enjoyed um but uh no it's all right we'll uh we'll warm up the world cup uh attitude you know be watching football nice and early it'll be good see this is the que- one question I, I have actually is is it on tv over there because i was checking for the uk and it isn't actually on tv it being twelve thirty p.m so not particularly yeah. useful it being moved um but for you guys is it on as like a red op- a red button kind of option or subscription maybe yeah, so it's a it's a subscription. Something um, I'll make this point very quick, but uh, something that's actually it frustrates my parents who are big um, football fans. No end. We have so much more access to English football uh, over here than uh, than you do than you do in England. So I can watch any FA Cup game. Um, basically, uh, the Reading games are all broadcast either through the Royals TV thing, which I think works domestically as well. Um, but also, um, they have some of their games on ESPN and things like that too. So yeah, you're, you're never in danger of, of missing a game, which is nice. Unless, of course, you sleep in over the game, but, uh, <laughs> I'll do my best to make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah definitely well yeah as i say no i don't think there's a particular reason it's been moved to lunchtime but um but yeah it has been uh nudged forward it is announced uh, at the start of december so make sure you arrived on time for that one on saturday um i mean the question is i guess with watford and is how seriously do we take it i think it's a really good point that they probably won't take it too seriously but i also think they probably have a bit of a deeper squad than we do generally speaking so Maybe yeah. um, maybe that'll kind of mitigate it a little bit. You look at the bench, they beat Norwich 1-0 away today with a late winner. You look at the bench, um, Ben Hamer is a name that is an absolute throwback. I'm not going to lie, I don't really recognise most of the names on the bench of um, of, of Watford. They change because... their squad every five minutes, Watford. Don't they? I mean, they, they, they're they one of these teams that you know brings in a new manager, a new striker or whatever every single season, it feels like. As long as we don't see Ishmael Assar, I'll be happy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, as I say, Ben Hamer is now 35, which is a good way of making most Reading fans feel old, because I remember him coming through the academy. Um, yeah. But it uh, also means, uh, I mean, th- Tom Deli bashir is kind of been in and around things. I don't think he was in the squad um, for this this game, though. But uh, yeah, it's, um, it's going to be an, an interesting one. I think for Reading, I think we can make changes without it being kind of a joke, if that makes sense. We can make changes and and bring in players like Shane Long, Boozenis can come in. Um, and Benge Nabisar, um, who didn't play, just to kind of rotate the squad. Because I do think one of the things we didn't mention about the the West Brom game is that we didn't make many changes other than the, a couple of enforced ones. And and that meant that we probably were a bit tired. I'd imagine that Paul Lintz is going to come out say and that. say that. So a good chance to kind of freshen things up at the very least without actually losing loads of quality. Completely agree. Completely agree that we looked a bit tired today, by the way. And I think, I do think that West Brom did as well. There were some misplaced passes, um, more misplaced passes than you'd expect from both teams, I think. But yeah, this is an opportunity to start some players who haven't been starting every game. Uh, if Fauna's fit, I'd love to see him. If, if Hutchinson's fit, I'd love to see him. And the same goes for Aziz. So, um, I also think this could be a good opportunity for Jao to, to start. Obviously, he hasn't been doing that so much recently. So yeah, there's, it, it's nice to have options, isn't it? Um, again, this speaks to the, um, the recruitment that was done in the summer and, and just really putting together a, if we can get them off the treatment table, then I think that we actually do have a squad that we can rotate and put out decent quality for a game like this. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, for sure. One quick note I'll add on Watford, because I was just mentioning Tom Deli Bashiru, who's actually out for a number of months with an injury. And Watford, uh, they're saying they have 11 players unavailable for uh, today's game against Norwich, although they um, 
do supposedly have two signings, just as we're joking that they have the t- new squad every five minutes. Um, two new signings, uh, Ishmael Kone and Mateus Nunez. Um, only one of which is related to U- Udinese. So, um, oh, okay. class, absolute classic Watford, really. Um, yep. when we'll be playing them. So those guys might pop up, both young players, uh, might be in the squad. Um, so yeah, I guess there's, I guess that's that's a bit of a boost for us in kind of a bit of a slightly crass way that they've got an injury crisis and stuff. And they, I do also, I do really think that Nathan's right that they're not going to be taking it seriously. It's at home. We've been good at home this year. I don't know what sort of crowd it's going to be, but yeah, well, I'm, I'm optimistic for this one. So let's do some predictions to round off the show. Um, an update on the... Uh, on the post no uh, post West Brom predictions, um, I got the my first proper score correct since Stoke at home. So I've now moved on to eleven points, lofty heights there. Um, also getting it correct was Sim. Um, we also had some correct uh, results. Uh, Ollie, Westy, and Adam all saying we were going to lose. So uh, Ben is still on top with twenty one points after he got Norwich and Swansea both spot on, and then we've got uh, Adam seventeen. Uh, Westy on 16 Handbags 14 um, Sims actually moved on 16 as well now I'm on 11 Ollie on 7 so uh, Ben well on top for the Prediction League at the moment the Watford game which I was actually going to mention very quickly will have a replay if we draw it um, replay is definitely in for the FA Cup this year so my prediction for this one I'm going to say a 2-0 win because I'm, I've convinced convinced myself in the last 15 minutes that we'll take it much more seriously than them and uh, and it'll be a nice little nice little cup run could be on the cards this year what do you reckon Ross? Yeah, I'm going to 4-0 Reading let's just go uh, the magic of the cup let's have some fun a Femi Aziz hat trick that's what I want that sounds fun. I'm keen with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way. I, I think it's uh it's the start of a glorious cut run. I there must be you must be right. There must be something in the in the podcast air now because I, I also have been convinced that Watford aren't gonna take it seriously. Where am I bringing that from? Eh, not sure, but uh no, let's go with that. Four nil Reading. Beautiful. Well, yeah, let's see. I, I think Paul Lins is the sort of manager that probably would take it seriously, although I don't want to hold that opinion to much scrutiny because he could well be talking now as we do the podcast that he's not going to bother for it. So um, <laughs> so let's wait and see. But yeah, we'll be back after the Watford game. We'll have a midweek free after that one as well, um, which is even more reason to hopefully get a good team out there and a good performance. Um, Ross started 2023 off with a defeat, but I don't think we're too downhearted. Thank you for coming on this week. Yeah, not bad at all. It, uh, we can only uh, get better from here. And, and like I said, Happy New Year, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. A rare post-game show for the Tyler SM podcast. Hopefully we'll um, be back pretty quickly after the Watford game. And Happy New Year. Come on, you ass. You smile, funny how the crowd's always